requires a big effort on the on the part. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I'll have to figure out where, where I was. <laughs> Used to be one of the most active chapters in the Valley, as I understand it, but uh, a strong chapter requires a big effort on the part of a strong core of volunteers and things just quieted down until they practically ceased to exist. Well, right before COVID hit, a meeting was held to reinvigorate the chapter and in, in January 2020. So now that is timing and so on. Uh, as COVID is uh, waning, we are full steam ahead on getting this chapter back to active. Now, um, here we are with our very first series of, uh, very first of a series of virtual presentations that will allow us to learn more about native plants from our home, own home or hotel or car or wherever. You will soon be hearing from Cynthia about the wonderful list of presentations that she's lined up already for the next few months and we plan to keep it going. Now, recently we had tabling events at the La Loma uh, Pollinator Festival, the pa Patterson Apricot Festival Fiesta, and the Stanislaus County Fair. And we've been collecting names and emails of people locally who are ready to help us promote the use of native plants, as I'll be talking about. The California Native Plant Society is obviously a statewide organization, and you can join it for a regular individual membership. Uh, of $50 to receive Flora and Fremontia magazines, get benefits such as discounts at nur certain nurseries, sales and such, and the ability to join two different chapters of the California Native Plant Society. So obviously we hope you join us here in the North San Joaquin chapter, which and whichever other chapter you feel a, a big kinship with. I said the membership was $50, but there are lower dues for people who have reduced incomes and higher membership levels for those who are able to help the organization more financially. Um, and it's a great cause. So to go to the membership online, it is just cnps.org slash membership. Um, and you know, you can Google it and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to find. You can also look at our uh, newsletter, which by the way, if you didn't get it, let me know um, in the chat. Um, I've, I've already gotten one email from someone who said the last round of newsletters that I sent out, um, the newsletter wasn't attached. So I, I obviously have some more newsletters to send out. But um, one of the things that we've been working on is our new newsletter the first in years. And the first one is hot off the presses. Volume one of the Oak Branch has been sent to all of our members via email. And I should point out that we intend to do the, everything by email. We recognize that there are some people who are actually prefer US mail. And for those who are inconvenienced, we do apologize, but we don't yet have the financial or volunteer base to put it together that, that way by US mail. We've decided to have some save some trees and remain electronic. So if this is a true problem, let us know because you know so far no one's actually said anything. So we're just assuming everything is hunky dory. Uh, the branch has a number of informative art. This uh, the Oak Branch has a number of informative articles on native plant subjects, photos, information about local events and happenings. It goes out to all of our members. You should have received it, but. If you are on our lists and uh, somehow you got missed, let me know in chat. Um, I'll be watching chat. And if you didn't get the newsletter, uh, let me know also. Um, we want this particular newsletter to get out to everyone. Uh, we also have a lot of people who have expressed interest in native plants, but who haven't joined us yet. And we hope to keep you in the loop as well. So uh, that perhaps you can actually join us for an event or two and remind uh, you that we are here. So why care about native plants? I asked that, I was asked that question recently, what's the deal? Isn't it just a hobby? No, we are here to find out more each day. We are finding out more each day about the true need to restore our environment as much as we can. The man who has been trying to explain this to us, um, the need for native plants with the most eloquence is Doug Ptolemy, a professor from Delaware. He's written three books on the subject, all of which circle around the theme that we have been damaging the environment dramatically, uh, but there is hope in native plants. 95% of all birds feed insects to their young. 
Caterpillars are more important, are an important component of that diet. And the caterpillars cannot live on non-native plants with very few exceptions. Native plants are critical to the ecosystem and a backyard with no native plants. And that is, that is there's a devastatingly high percentage of them that are just that are an ecological dead zone. Uh, planting native plants in our yards helps moths, butterflies, native bees, and other pollinators, and therefore birds. And the web goes on and on. Our cities need to be not need not be devoid of butterflies. So, for more information about this, you can watch a one-hour video that knocked me over like a brick. This was the talk back in 2018. It's the uh, the title is right here. Douglas Ptolemy restoring nature relationships is the the name of the video. This was a talk back in 2018 by Doug Ptolemy to the CNPS in Los Angeles in February of 2018. Just put in Doug Ptolemy restoring nature's relationships into YouTube, um, the screenshot or on, on Google or whatever, um, and you'll be able to watch that video. And if you haven't seen it, please watch it. Since we have been ramping things up, we have been holding, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, we have been holding uh, field trips, but we expect really to pour it on this coming year. And as we come into fall, we will be concentrating on the fact that fall is the time to plant native gardens. They are very successful if you start by seed in the fall or by planting new plants. We have a native plant sale coming up on October 22nd, and we also want to point out that Sacramento is going to be holding a plant sale coming up as well. So uh, all of, again, all of this is in the newsletter. We'll be pointing to events coming up to the, demonstrate the art of installing native plants. And again, all of this is in the newsletter. We expect to send out our next newsletter in November that, and that will keep, ta uh, keep, we'll keep talking about getting your fall and winter gardens in order. And then the spring we'll reap what we sow. We'll look at wildflowers and have field trips galore. So we do need volunteers to take on certain positions on our executive board and on various committees. We hope to have a project crew who can learn the ins and outs of planting native plants, maintaining them, and can help us uh, set up native plant islands, demonstration gardens, butterfly habitat, or all around the Central Valley, and help us maintain the gardens such as La Loma Native Garden that's already out there. With so much habitat wiped out by the agricultural department, it is high time we put back, and this is just the organization to do it. We need a conservation committee that looks at local issues and advocates for native plants. We need a, an event committee to help us create an enviable and varied list of things to do and places to go, including so many wonderful locations that are already exist around our area. And we need to do more tabling events to let people know what we do and educate everyone on the need of native plants. There is so much we can do and it takes people's uh, people and effort. And with that in mind, let me tell you at long last, we finally have an in-person social event um, in, on the schedule on September 17th at La Loma Native Garden in Modesto, which is a beautiful garden that you really gotta see. We'll be gathering to socialize and plan and strategize and sign up for things and figure out just exactly what, how we can make all of this wonderful stuff happen. It's a wine and cheese social with all the information in the newsletter, which as I said before, let me know if you didn't get to the newsletter and I'll be happy to send it to you. The photos I'm showing, well, I'm not showing any photos, but um, it, it's a beautiful newsletter. <laughs> I've actually got a bunch of photos. I didn't have time to stick them into the slideshow, but you just have to believe me. Um, I do have a lot, of, a lot of photos that you're gonna be seeing in future newsletters. Uh, the photos I'm showing are, of the garden during the spring. So if I had photos, they would be of the garden in the spring, but it's gonna be beautiful in September as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Cynthia and I will be in chat for those with questions and comments. There you go, Cynthia. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. Yeah, everybody, we're really eager to get our chapter going and um, you know, we look forward to all of you participating. Um, so I just want to mention before I introduce our illustrious speaker that we do have a really great lineup of uh, Zoom events, and Arvin is the first one, and I'll, I'll talk about him when I when, after I mention the others. But they're going to typically be on the second Monday of the month. We're trying to stick to that, and we're going to skip the month 
where there's a um, big conference in San Jose, and we're probably going to skip December, but we have uh, quite a few others already lined up. So um, on Monday to September 12th, we'll have Christoph Kaczynski. Some of you may know him. He's a very active member of the uh, California Native Plant Society in Santa Clara Valley, and his topic is Reliable California Native Plants for a Garden with No Irrigation, which is just what we need out here in the valley. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but it's, it's all described in the newsletter. So ask Mike for the newsletter, and then you'll be all set to uh, join us. Then, in, um, a, no, in, in a, I don't have any, um, October, I don't have anyone right now for October. Oh, no, I just said we're not doing that because that's the big conference. Thanks. Um, <laughs> anyway, on Monday, November 14th, we have our own Carl Hill, who's a member of our Native Plant Society, and he also is the owner of uh, the uh, Blossom Hill Natives, which is a wonderful native plant nursery right here in uh, the San Joaquin Valley and near um, Oakdale. Um, so Carl uh, will be talking about planting and growing a California native garden. That's a great topic. Then on January 8th, we uh, are going to have a talk by um, Dr. Jeannie Knapp. And Dr. Knapp was my instructor for the California um, Naturalist Program, which was just an incredible online and in-person event. And what um, Dr. Knapp is going to talk about is highlights of great nature-based day trips in the San Joaquin Valley. So I learned so much by going on these trips where, you know, we learned all the, the places to go to see native plants and birds and everything else that unless you're very, very, very familiar with the area, you might not know. Okay, so the two, several of the speakers are here in, in the um, audience. If you want to make a little note in the chat window, that'd be great. Okay, now I'm going to introduce Arvind. Um, so uh, there's Arvind. You want to put the spotlight on Arvind, Judy? Um, so Arvind's topic is biodiversity and the California Native Plant Gardener. Um, I've actually known Arvin for so many years, I can hardly remember how long, because we met um, long ago on the East Coast before we even knew anything about native plants, and then coincidentally we both started doing native plants. Um, but uh, he's uh, going to talk about what makes uh, California a world hotspot for biodiversity, why should the home gardener care, learn about the critical role native plants play in a healthy environment, and how human pressures are driving them to the brink of extinction, and what you can do as a home gardener to do and save and celebrate them. So, uh, as I mentioned, Arvind's a longtime friend of mine. He's well known throughout CNPS. He's one of the co founders, along with me and, and several others, uh, of the uh, Growing Natives Garden Tour, which has been going on for quite a few years. Um, and he has a garden on the tour. Uh, and that's with the Santa Clara Valley CNPS. He's a past president of that chapter and a former board member of CMPS. He also has a fantastic garden. And um, Arvin, once you start talking, I will put into the chat window the um, link to your garden on the, uh, the Growing, Native, Growing Natives Garden website. They changed the name, so I'm trying to remember that. And he also uh, manages a community garden at Lake Cunningham. So with that, I turn it over to Arvin. And cheers, Arvin. No, Robin, you're muted. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, it's not often that you get introduced by someone you've known since 1983. So it's a special privilege <laughs> for me today. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Oh, uh, hey, Aaron, before you get going, do you want to take questions in the... Um, during the talk, or you want to wait till the end? Uh, if it is something quick and easy that I can fold into the slide, yes, I'll take them on the spot. Uh, my total presentation is about an hour. So I don't want to keep people uh, way beyond uh, the allotted time. So if it's a longer discussion, I might uh, postpone it for later. Is that okay? Okay, good. Okay, so let me let me start. Thank you. Um, 
all for coming. And I'm so impressed with the North San Joaquin chapter. You have uh, 31 people in the meeting today. And this is about three times of what we get in the photo group in Santa Clara Valley chapter. So congratulations on this first meeting. And I'm sure it's going to grow. Um, my talk tonight is um, going to outline the major environmental issues facing California the role that native plants play in a healthy environment and what it all means to us as home gardeners and the choices that we make in our gardens. The questions I'll be asking is, what can we do to support the environment, conserve natural resources, and save money and effort along the way? Um, by way of introduction, I grew up in India and I came here as a grad student, not knowing what lay ahead. And here I am 43 years later, uh, 40 of them spent in California. Um, I'm an engineer by training, and everything I know about native plants, I've learned from uh, my membership in CNPS, from the books and classes recommended by CNPS, and by trying to grow these plants myself at home. So I know that there are many people in the meeting who have uh, quite amazing resumes. So please pardon my lapses, if any and uh, please contribute to, to the conversation. Um, tonight's talk has two major parts. The first part is about the issues facing California's environment. And I have to warn you that this part can feel like a big downer. It's all doom and gloom. And if it uh, all seems a bit too much, please bear with me until we get to the second part, which is much more upbeat, which is all about solutions in which you and native plants play a key role. My thesis, the, the thesis of this talk is that by growing native plants more widely, we can reduce, if not eliminate, many environmental problems. And the focus in this talk will be on what you and I can do about that. Here is my top five list of, of problems. Um, First one is global warming. Notice that I don't call it climate change. Uh, that seems too neutral to me. The warming is real. The glaciers are melting. The planet is cooking. Uh, th there's no uh, beating about the bush on that. Number two is water scarcity in an area which is already an arid area. Uh, large portions of California are either desert or near desert-like conditions especially the population centers. We're going to talk more about this later. Number three is growing energy demand. And uh, this is related both to item one and to item two, as we will see. Item four is increased pollution, uh, which is really a byproduct of item three. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that. Item five is declining biodiversity. And uh, I hope that at the end of the talk, you will get a good sense of why you should care about declining biodiversity. Uh, the scientists tell us that we are living through one of the largest mass extinctions in history, not just human history, mass extinctions in history. And most of it is due to human impacts. A note about global warming. Um, we are simply producing too much carbon dioxide, methane, and other, um, other um, gases that the environment cannot handle. The radiation from the sun hits the earth, and some of it radiates right back out to space under normal circumstances. But when you have greenhouse gases in excess in the environment, they actually reflect some of that radiation right back to Earth. And that's what causes the, the warming. When I first came to California, my image of California was that of a land of perennial rivers fed by melting snows from the Sierra Nevada. It reminded me of the Ganga Valley in India where I grew up, which is sustained by rivers from the mighty Himalayas. So I thought that water was plentiful and perennial in California. Um, having lived here and having done the research, uh, I now realize that the reality is very different from the mental image that I once had. 
this chart uh, shows the precipitation map of the uh, continental United States. Um, and the blue areas signify areas of high precipitation and the brown areas, uh, not so much. Uh, let's look at some numbers. Boston gets 44 inches of precipitation a year. Some of it has snow, some of it has rain, but it's 44 inches and it is spread throughout the 12 months. It's not concentrated over a short period. Buffalo, New York, 39 inches. Columbus, Ohio, 38 inches. Raleigh, North Carolina, 43 inches. Atlanta, Georgia, 49 inches. Miami, 58 inches. Chicago, 36 inches. Minneapolis, 28. Lincoln, Nebraska, 28. And Dallas, 29. So you see, all these locations are east of the Rockies, right? Look at us. Where I live, San Jose gets 15 inches of rain per year. And where you are, most of you are in Modesto, which is which gets 10 inches of rain per year. If you look at the distribution of when that rain comes down from the sky, you see this distinct saddleback shape where the wettest months are the winter months. And for about seven months uh, in the middle of the year, there's little to no rain. And that's San Jose. Modesto's chart looks very similar, except it is lower by five inches overall, right? Uh, the red and the blue lines indicate the temperature gradient. Um, red is the highs and blue is the lows. And you notice uh, that our summers are warm and dry, right? And our winters are wet and cool. This is a very, very important aspect of California's uh, climate and environment that we need to keep in mind when we are thinking about what to grow in our gardens. You know that the definition of a desert is any area that gets less than 10 inches of rain a year. So Modesto is right there on the threshold of being a desert. And San Jose is not that much better. We, we are awfully close. For seven months of the year, there is little to no rain. This climate pattern where you have wet winters and dry summers is called a Mediterranean climate. And there are five locations on Earth besides uh, counting California that have this kind of climate. California is among the driest of those five. One thing to know about our plants in, in our environment in California is that plant dormancy often occurs in the summer not the winter. This is opposite of what happens in the East Coast and Northern Europe, where plants go dormant when it's frozen over and the period of growth is the spring and the summer. So um, we are not like the rest of the country or Northern Europe. We are Mediterranean. Um, some more figures. Uh, this map shows the annual precipitation where I live in San Jose um, over the last 60 years or so. And you see that there's quite a bit of fluctuation. But if you look for trends in the last 10, 15 years, you can see that the trend is downward. The average is 15 inches. And back in 2013, we had less than four inches of rainfall. And according to scientists who study this, um, we are running into dry cycles that have, that have not been seen in over 400 years. That, that's the data. Some more data for you. This chart is an estimate of what the precipitation has been like over the last 1,200 years. And to get this data, uh, scientists analyze tree rings. And in the chart, the middle dashed line is the, is the overall average. The areas that are red show areas where the precipitation was lower than average, and the areas in blue are where it was higher than average. So if you look at the most recent trends, last century, we were actually in a wetter than normal phase. But it seems that in this century, we are actually entering a dry phase. And this phase 
we think it runs seven year cycles, but scientists say that it could run much longer. If we continue to run California as if the longest drought we are ever going to encounter is about seven years, we are living in a dream world. And another note about water is that agriculture, which is 3% of California's economy today, uses 80% of the water consumed by both people and businesses. Another article from about 17 years ago, but it's still relevant. California's thirst for water will jump by 40% over the next 25 years, with much of the water going for landscaping. Half of all the water used by inland home growers goes to irrigating yards. And I want to show you some data on this. When um, new housing developments are built, part of the permitting process is that the builder must secure adequate water supply for the new homes. And these are the numbers they use for planning how much water is needed. They plan for 174,000 gallons per year per home. And this is how that water is allocated. About 17% goes towards the shower, 4% goes towards the toilet, 9% goes towards kitchen and the lavatory sinks, and about 4% to the clothes washer. And all these are what you would consider essential uses of water. They're necessary for your standard of living, for health, for hygiene, and so on and so forth. What about the remainder? 57% of that allocation is for watering your lawn and your foundation shrubs. And they build in 9% extra because we often overwater our yards. And if you add the two numbers, a total of 66%, that is two thirds of your water allocation is for the garden, for the yard. And remember that for most homes, this is high quality drinkable water that's going towards landscaping. Some more notes on uh, the situation with water in California. Um, what is imported from faraway places to support California cities and towns. And transporting water consumes huge amounts of energy. In the pictures, you see the California aqueduct where it ends at the valley floor level and then it is pumped up to several hundred feet higher where, and, and it, it is pumped up regularly until it reaches the level, the floor of the Mojave Desert. And that is how farming in the Antelope Valley and the desert are made possible through the California aqueduct, which is basically Northern California water, which is transported through these delivery systems to, to places far away. The environmental impact of this is that large scale water consumption at the source upsets the ecological balance. And the examples I have here for you are Owens Valley in the Eastern Sierra, which used to be a lush wetland habitat, which is now dry and there are dust storms there because all the water rights in Owens Valley were bought by LA Water and Power. And that water is now being piped to the San Fernando Valley to grow grass. Um, LA Water and Power also owns the rights to many streams that feed Mono Lake. And were it not for a court case that the environmentalists won, Mono Lake would have run dry as well. So now Mono Lake is required to be at a minimum level, which is far reduced from its original levels. Uh, LA Water and Power are on the hook to maintain that level, but they still pump water. They still take water from Mono Lake streams. Um, another example relevant to the Bay Area is the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in the Sierra. Um, Hetch Hetchy was a valley to rival Yosemite. And the city of San Francisco decided to basically dam it and store water there. And uh, pipelines from there basically provide water to uh, large sections of the San Francisco Bay Area. 
Another aspect to consider is what do end users pay for the water that they get? And, and my take on this is that the end user cost is too low. Water is, is not being priced uh, suitably given how expensive it is to acquire it and to ship it and so on and so forth. And a data fact that I have, uh, this figure may be dated, but at one time, 55% of San Joaquin Valley residents did not have water meters, meaning no matter how much water they use, their bill did not change. I'm told that this is changing now, but it's the conversion, conversion is not, not complete. The question to ask is, um, well, uh, another note uh, about the San Joaquin Valley is the second largest river in the state is the San Joaquin River, and it has run dry. It does not go all the way from the Sierra Nevada to, to the ocean because its waters are locked up behind Freehan Dam and the water rights have been sold off to agriculture. Some of that water goes towards the American lawn. It's estimated that 50 million homes in America are landscaped with lawns. And tot when added up their area, totals 32 million acres, which is larger than the size of Pennsylvania. And grass clippings are the largest irrigated crop in our country. To produce that crop, we consume 70 million pounds of fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides annually. There are also leaf blowers that are involved. And the lawn care industry is estimated at 29 billion. It may have grown since um, I got this data. But based on this, um, on average, each household is spending $1,200 per year towards maintaining the lawn. Some facts about pollution created by garden tools. A lawnmower emits as much pollution in an hour as a car driven 1,000 miles. And this seems hard to believe, but consider that the auto industry is heavily regulated, especially in the state of California for emissions. And they have many, many uh, improvements to, to auto technology. Those improvements, are those regulations do not apply to low horsepower machines like lawnmowers and leaf blowers. And these machines account for 10% or more of the nation's smog forming pollution. In Southern California lawn, alone, lawn and garden equipment such as lawnmowers, edges, trimmers, leaf blowers, and chainsaws produce per day more than 100 tons of pollution. We use chemicals in our gardens. We are encouraged to use them. They're, they're inexpensive, they're widely available. The reality is that between 50 to as much as 95% of the fertilizer we use in our lawns actually doesn't stay in our lawns. It leaches into the ground. And during wet months, it, it uh, through runoff, ends up in our creeks, rivers, and aquifers. It has been found that the major source of pesticides in urban areas, in urban streams, are home applications of products designed to kill insects and weeds. So pesticides and herbicides are ending up in our local creeks. And the, the key thing to notice here is that these are not single point pollution um, engines. This is not a single factory or a handful of locations that are emitting most of the pollution. This pollution is being created by millions of us maintaining our yard in the false hope that these chemicals are not harmful to the environment. Some notes about biodiversity. We talked about the loss of biodiversity. Let's define what it is. Biodiversity is the variability among living organisms is the number of species that can coexist in a particular ecosystem. It's not how many uh, individuals of a particular species, but rather the number of different species that can coexist. Um, I'm showing you 
Um, well, you should know that California is regarded as one of the hotspots of biodiversity in the world. And that's both good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that California is very biodiverse. And I'll give you some data on that. That's something to celebrate. But the bad news is that you get on the hotspot list because that biodiversity is under threat. So it's both a cause for celebration and a cause for concern. Botanists define, uh, divide the world into floristic provinces. And a floristic province is a geographic area with a relatively uniform composition of plant species. So the California floristic province, which you see in the, in the brown or maroon color on the screen, uh, covers most of California except the deserts. And it extends a little bit into Southern Oregon and a little bit into Northern Baja California. And it actually includes two islands off the coast of Baja California. That's the California floristic province as defined by the botanists. This province contains 5,862 species and subspecies of native plants. And to appreciate what this number means is this is comparable. It's slightly less, but not that much less than the total number of plant species in the rest of the country and Canada combined. It's, it's really mind boggling, uh, the diversity that California has. An example, out of 50 species of cyanosis in North America, 41 of them occur in California. One of them occurs on the east coast of the United States, and eight of them are found in Mexico. So as far as nature is concerned, California is the laboratory for cyanosis evolution. Out of the nearly 6,000 species, about 2,100 species or 36% are endemic. That means that they're only found in California. They're not found anywhere else on Earth. And you might appreciate that this biodiversity comes from the size of the state, but also within the large state that we live in, there's varied topography, varied climate, varied soil. So there are many, many uh, microclimates and ecosystems and native plants have evolved to fill the ecological niches, the many niches in California. So the bad news is that our biodiversity has been in decline for 200 or more years. And this is mainly due to pressures from ranching, agriculture, invasive plants, dam building, urbanization, even recreation. And the common factor here is that these are all triggered by human uses and activities. So this brings me to my thesis slide. Uh, the, my, my thesis for today's talk is, what can we do, what can you and I do to promote biodiversity, to create habitat, to conserve water and energy, and to reduce or prevent pollution? And I'm asserting here that the solution is something very simple. By growing more native plants, we can make a difference in each one of these areas, these problem areas. And when more people adopt these same practices, the impact adds up. Um, a good way to consider these problems is that if these problems are human made, if they're created by us humans, it is within our power to solve them as well. So now let's talk about the many benefits of native plants. But before we get there, let's talk about um, some definitions. What actually makes a plant native? Let's look at some definitions. First one, any plant that occurs and grows naturally in a specific region or locality. Now, this is the common understanding that many people have. If they see something growing in the wild, in the wild areas on its own without watering or care, they assume it's native. But the reality is that we've been disturbing California's environment now for more than 200 years. And so species like eucalyptus, like vinca, like calla lily have naturalized in California. You will see them in the wild, doesn't make them native. 
Second definition is a plan that naturally occurred in an area before disturbance by humans. Um, this gets closer to, to uh, the issue, but I think it ignores the engagement of native Californians with the landscape. You know, native Californians have been in, in California for at least 10,000 years, maybe more. And they were not passive observers of the landscape. They were actively managing the landscape. Uh, so the generally accepted definition of native plants today is a plan that was growing in California prior to the arrival of Europeans. Some more uh, factoids about native plants. Remember that every plant that occurs naturally is native to some particular region on earth. And a plant's native range may be very small or may be very large. Uh, in the Santa Clara uh, County, we have a plant called Coyote Ceanothus, Ceanothus fedicea, which only occurs on the hillsides near Morgan Hill. It occurs nowhere else in the county and nowhere else in the state. It's evolved for that soil and that, that, uh, those conditions. So it's very limited range. Uh, by contrast, if you look at a plant like Yarrow, it's native to California. I've seen it on the East Coast. I just came back from England and uh, Iceland, and I saw it growing in both those places. I've hiked in the Himalaya, and it grows in the Himalaya. So the common yarrow is circumpolar in the Northern Hemisphere, is found throughout the Northern Hemisphere in temperate zones. In a large state like California, every plant that is native to California does not grow or occur in every corner of the state. And therefore, it is often useful to talk in terms of what is locally native. Native plants are naturally water-wise because um, they are adapted to the local conditions. And established native plants survive on the natural precipitation of their native range. And in the gardening context, established native plants look lush with just once a month watering in the summer. There are some native plants that actually resent summer water. They will not do well if you give them summer water. And an important point to note for all um, newbie native plant gardeners is that all young plants, native or otherwise, need water to get established. It's only when the root system is fully grown that uh, you can leave them alone and let them fend for themselves. We've been told often that native plants use less water. I want to show you some data, some real data to back that up. The city of Santa Monica conducted a study called Garden Garden. Uh, they owned two homes side by side in a residential area. And they used the buildings for as offices, but they decided to landscape one yard traditionally with lawn and some foundation shrubs and irrigation and all of that. And I think you can see the sign, it says police. Um, and the house next door, they landscaped with native plants. There's no lawn here. You can see some decomposed granite, a lot of native plantings, perhaps some mulching. Um, they monitored the water use and the maintenance effort for these two gardens over a number of years. I have data here for two years. This covers two years from November 04 to August to October 06. The red line shows you what the rainfall pattern was like. So 05 was a wet rain year, 06 not so wet. The dark blue area shows you um, how much water went into the traditional garden. As you expect, summertime it needed more water, wintertime it needed less, but there was a baseline of water that was needed throughout the year for the traditional garden. In the light blue at the bottom of the chart, you see the water that went into the native plant garden. And here you see that again in the winter it needed little to no water, it needed some water in the summer. But in comparison to the traditional garden, it is a much, much smaller fraction. If you add the numbers, it turns out the native garden consumed one-tenth of the water of the traditional garden. 
And I want you to connect this fact back to the slide I showed you earlier, where fully 66% of the water allocation for a home was for watering the yard. This figure shows you what is achievable, what is possible. You can cut the 66% down to 6% by planting natives. Take a look at what went, how many hours of maintenance it took. So the green bars here correspond to the traditional garden, which required maintenance every month, some months more, some months less, but it required maintenance every month. The orange bars represent the maintenance required for the native garden. And it's mostly less than what was required for the traditional garden, and some months no maintenance at all. If you add up the numbers, the native garden required only one fifth of the maintenance hours as the traditional garden. So in summary, native plant gardens are convenient and economical. They require less maintenance because they're naturally adapted. They don't need as much water. They don't need as much pruning. Remember that watering and fertilizing leads to plant growth and excessive plant growth requires the gardener to come and do maintenance. So if you have a garden that requires less water and the plants are slower growing, you will need to do less pruning maintenance. Overall, in the long run, native plant gardens save you money on water, on chemicals, and on gasoline. I have a slide about the habitat value of, of native plants, and I'm going to borrow heavily from Doug Tallamy on this. Uh, but this is something that I had no appreciation for when I first planted native plants in my garden. I was thinking low maintenance. And uh, within six months or so, I noticed that as the plants grew, there were different kinds of insects and um, wasps and critters and birds visiting my garden, things that I had never noticed before. And as the garden matured, th their population also increased. So the thing that I, I have come to appreciate is the, the ecosystem and how it functions. In the ecosystem, plants are at the bottom of the food chain. Plants are things that directly feed certain insects and other animals, or indirectly, they feed the animals that are consumed by higher animals, right? But it all starts with plants. Plants do the magic of converting CO2, sunlight, and water into carbohydrates and tissue, cellulose tissue, that is then food for other creatures. What makes native plants special? Native plants are special because they have co-evolved with native wildlife over thousands of years. They, ha they are made for each other. When you look at the hummingbird's beak and when you look at the length of the California fuchsia flower, it's not coincidence that they are the right length. They're made for each other. And there are some kinds of fauna that are very, very choosy about the plants they consume. So in the lower left, I'm showing you a picture of the pipeline swallowtail caterpillar. And the butterfly will nectar on all kinds of flowers, but it will not lay its eggs on any plant other than the pipeline. So if you want these butterflies to, to be around forever, we must conserve all the habitats that in which the pipeline occurs, including planting them in our gardens. This is Doug Tallamy's first book. Um, it's, it's based mainly on his um, experiences on the East Coast, but the principles he's talking about in the book are universally acceptable. And I want to show you some data from, from the appendix of this book. Um, Native plants produced four times more insect biomass than non-native plants. And if you look at generalist insects, insects that are not that choosy about the plants they consume, even among those generalists, native plants produce twice the insect biomass than did non-natives. 
Native plants attracted more than three times as many species of insects as non-native plants. This, this directly links to, to biodiversity that we are talking about. And if you care about butterflies and moths and caterpillars, native plants supported 35 times more caterpillar biomass than non-native plants. It's, it's not even close. So the next time anyone asks you what is so special about native plants, tell them that the habitat value of native plants is unmatched, simply unmatched, and it is borne out by scientific data. I want to share with you some success stories. You know, it's not too late. If, if you make the changes, it, the, the environment responds to positive changes. So this story is about the endangered El Segundo blue butterfly that is, um, has a uh, host relationship with Ereognum parvifolium, uh, cliff buckwheat. And this buckwheat grows naturally on the sand dunes next to LAX airport. And those, that habitat was destroyed and was ordered to be restored to, to uh, take care of the butterfly. But not only did the butterfly population rebound, but the butterfly then began to find other restoration sites. Seven miles away in Redondo Beach and Torrance, the butterfly made its way there. And over the last decade, it has traveled 20 miles to the Palos Verde Peninsula, which is, which is south of there. So the, the point here is that it is not too late. And if you plant native plants, the, the animals will find them. Another study from San Diego found that cities like San Diego, which retained 30% or more of their native plant vegetation, experienced fewer plant extinctions. If you're familiar with San Diego, you know that it's mainly built on mesas and there are inter, there are canyons and lagoons uh, interleaving the mesas. So most of the development is on those mesa plateaus, but the canyons are protected. They are not developed. And so a city like San Diego, which has pockets of of native habitat, intact native habitat, this development um, actually saves uh, native plants. So this is a note for, for city planners that instead of growing like Los Angeles or growing even like San Jose, my hometown, if we can conserve corridors of, of wild habitat, uh, we can have both. We can have the best of both worlds which is a uh, quality of life, you know, in an urban area, plus a uh, good, good quality environment. Quick notes about pollution. Pollution in the home garden comes from pesticides, from herbicides and fertilizers. And if you use, if you grow native plants, you don't need any of these kinds of chemicals. And you can basically eliminate runoff pollution from your yard. Um, the city of Ann Arbor in 2006 passed an ordinance that limited the use of lawn fertilizers. And within the first year, they noticed that phosphorus levels dropped almost 30% within one year. So imagine if every city in California were to, to adopt laws like this, it would be a tremendous boon to, to the environment. I have a few slides here on, uh, on the aesthetic appeal of native plants. I've heard from a few people that native plants look weedy and they don't look very attractive and, and that's why they don't grow them in their home gardens. And I have to say that those folks have not really done their research. Um, let me share some, some data with you. The early European settlers wrote really glowing accounts of California flowers and plants. And there's a very moving passage that I want to share with you. Um, it's written by Jeff Mayfield, whose family arrived in California in 1850. And Judith Lowry quotes this in, in her book, Gardening with a Wild Heart. Um, quote, as we passed below the hills, the whole plain was covered with great patches of rose, yellow, scarlet, orange, and blue. Some of the patches of one color were a mile or more across. My daddy had traveled a great deal and it was not easy to get him excited about wildflowers of pretty scenery. But he said that he would not have believed that such a place existed if he had not seen it himself. 
So that's the California that existed. Um, much of it is gone, but some of it still remains. If you've been following the super bloom years and, and the pictures and the videos, and perhaps you uh, drove up and experienced it in person, some of this extraordinary beauty is still with us. So um, I, th this is the slide that I wanna show folks who think native plants are weedy. Um, I want them to gaze at this picture for 10 minutes. Um, Barton has started visiting California from the 1700s and documenting our flora and taking seeds back to Europe. And California plants like Ceanothus, Manzanita, Poppy, and Clarkia have been grown in European gardens for over a century. Even today, the British Thompson & Morgan seed catalog has many California natives in there. Uh, is not widely known in California, but, but the largest grower of California bulbs uh, is, is the Netherlands. They grow California bulbs to this date. They very proudly talk about which year um, these bulbs were collected. Then they export them to an East, Cro East Coast uh, bulb company, and uh, we in California can, can re-import them back into California. They're very inexpensive. Um, so, so this, these are. If if our plants are not beautiful, um, why are they capturing the imagination of people halfway around the world? And the last note I have about beauty is that native plants bring a sense of place to our gardens. Now, this is a, an intangible kind of concept, but. Um, I want to, to show you a picture from Sunset Magazine um, and ask you, you know, where in the world do you think this garden is located? I was a faithful subscriber to the magazine for eight years um, and, and I absolutely loved it. I learned a lot about ornamental gardening from reading it, but I stopped subscribing because I got tired of the non-native content. Um, anyway, um, I will tell you what my research uh, shows. This short tree on the left-hand side is the Katsura tree from Japan. The taller uh, tree on the, on the, sorry, first was on the left, this one is on the right, uh, is the Kousa dogwood from Korea. Purple bush in the back is Loropetalum from China. And the purple flowers in the lower right are a variety of geranium from South Africa. And smack in the middle of the picture is the Western, uh, is the chain fern from California and the Western United States. What's interesting about this choice of, of plants is, first of all, it's very cosmopolitan. It has no sense of place. It, you cannot peg this garden to any particular spot on earth. This garden could be in California. It could be in Britain. It could be in Australia or New Zealand. You wouldn't know. Um, this garden happens to be in Lafayette, California. And uh, the research that I did on these plants showed me that all of these plants come from much, much moister habitats. They, their native range is much more moist than Lafayette, California. This garden survives and thrives in Lafayette, California because of imported water. And if you were to turn off the tap, this garden would be gone within a matter of months. So this style of gardening developed during the European age of discovery. At that time, plants from faraway lands were hard to get and very expensive. And this type of garden came to signify wealth and prestige. Today, things have changed and many people can afford these plants from around the world and also afford the cost of water. And I call this style of gardening the because I can style. Um, the world has changed. And just because we can do something is no longer a good reason to do it. The question we need to ask is, is what I'm about to do scalable? If 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 or a million people repeat what I'm doing, 
does do conditions on earth improve do they get better as a result or do they get worse so you have to measure everything on the yardstick of scalability because because of the phenomenal growth in 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 the world today economic and and otherwise um so we live in an age where we've taxed the environment to its limits and there is a need now to enter the age of sustainability. Um, what can you and I do to re reduce or reverse global warming? There's a lot of talk today about adapting to global warming, about planting plants from Southern California, et cetera. There's not enough talk about reversing what's going on. And to me, the, the solution is very clear which is that we humans need to produce much less carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by conserving gas, electricity, water, by buying, by consuming less, and finding ways to consume more carbon dioxide. By that, I mean capturing the carbon in the air uh, and sequestering it in plant tissue. So plants are absorbing sunlight and converting carbon dioxide to plant tissue. And we can, we can support this process by protecting and enlarging the natural areas that we have and by demanding that we plant more native trees, shrubs, and perennials where they, where they have been wiped out, such as urban areas. That is essentially the, the sum of my talk. I want to show you some pictures of what native plant gardens look through the seasons. And you might see some photo, a photo there that you might recognize. Uh, this is my garden in March with poppy, manzanita, uh, and cyanothus. Uh, this is a few years ago. This is a friend's garden in Campbell, um, the first year of planting. There's a lot of poppy, but there's also lilac verbena. And uh, way over to, in the lower right is uh, Shasta buckwheat uh, peeping through. Uh, this is from your fine city of Modesto, the Lalova Native Garden. Um, I was very fortunate to visit in April, uh, thanks to Cynthia, and I was quite blown away by, by the size, the ambition, the design, and the maintenance of this lovely garden. Um, you, should, you, you have much to celebrate and to be proud of. Um, and I think you, you can engage with this garden learn a lot and, and support the garden. This is a, a parking strip in Richmond. Um, uh, this is Annie Jensen's house. And it's the most delightful border of, of native uh, annuals and perennials. This is red ribbons and California poppy. This is Ruby Chalice Clarkia in June in my garden. It's the last wildflower to bloom. In July, there's not much flowering. Um, it's, it's a quiet time, but the California poppy with suitable mulching and um, pruning and watering uh, can be a perennial in your garden with, without much water at all. August, again, a quiet time in the garden. Um, I love the grasses in the garden. Uh, they're very dynamic, slightest breeze and they are moving about. I've seen um, birds foraging at the base of the grasses. Um, so so they're, they're good habitat. Skipping uh, September in October, um, Saushneria is still blooming. Uh, the hummingbirds go nuts over this plant. So in summary, protecting the environment and promoting biodiversity begins at home. I want folks to think about going green in the yard, in the garden, as well as inside the house. And we can protect and support the environment one garden at a time. A few notes on things you can do. Um, first and foremost, educate yourself. What you don't know, you can learn. Um, there are many, many good books out now about native plants. Um, the Native Plant Society is a fantastic resource. Um, as I said before, um, attend the talks, ask questions. 
if there are field trips with, with docents, uh, go on those field trips. You'll learn a lot and you'll bring all that knowledge home and apply it to your garden. If you can go on a native garden tour here in the Santa Clara Valley chapter, our tour is the Growing Natives Garden Tour. Uh, it has a phenomenal website with um, archives of many years of pictures, plant lists, descriptions. It's all on there. So if you're browsing, if you're doing research, it's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, if you haven't already, please join the Native Plant Society. Um, it's a nonprofit environmental organization that wants not just your money. Of course, the money helps, but we want more than that. We want you to engage. We want you to um, come to the walks, come to the talks, ask questions, educate yourself, get engaged, and spread the word. Um, if you have the bandwidth, volunteer at a local native plant nursery or a restoration site. Uh, observing a native plant in its native habitat you will learn a lot of things about what makes that plant happy and what you need to do in your own garden. And if all this knowledge is, is uh, if you're familiar with all this stuff, then I say that you're in a, in a highly educated and informed bracket of the population and it's your turn to educate other people. Uh, get a group of neighbors together, show them slides like these, um, spread the word um, at the block party in your in your block, you know, take flyers and, and spread the word. Um, the biggest thing you can do if you have a lawn, lose it. This article is by Peter Gleick of the Pacific Institute, uh, a respected um, institute. And uh, two quotes from here, the idea that a home or business requires a green turf lawn is an archaic and increasingly inappropriate notion. We need to move faster to replace ornamental turf with other beautiful landscapes, including low water using native plants, flowers, and gardens. Some resources, if there's only one book you can afford, get the first one. Uh, the three authors between them have more than a hundred years of work experience with California native plants. They, they are the experts of the field. Uh, the second book is written by a, a chapter member in Santa Clara Valley chapter, Helen Popper, who's also an economics pr professor. She went to the gardening with natives group. It's a subgroup of the chapter. She went to their meetings uh, regularly and took copious notes. And in those meetings, people discussed what they did last week or last month, uh, what kind of maintenance, planting, watering, et cetera, they were doing. And out of those notes, she has produced this lovely book, which is beautifully illustrated, but it's also her writing style is very, very evocative and, and wonderful to read. So you could get this, open it up to August and get a ton of ideas on what plants you could introduced to your garden and which plants need work in the month of August. It's, it's a great book. Nancy Bauer's book is a great one if you're interested in wildlife value, habitat value. Uh, master gardeners are a great resource for organic uh, gardening, uh, gardening without pesticides and chemical use. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge on, on edible plant gardening. And uh, I'm told that they are introducing some native plant classes in the curriculum also. So they're a very, very good resource. Um, if you haven't connected with them, I encourage you. And finally, uh, Dr. Gordon Frankie of UC Berkeley has done a lot of research into bees, both native and honey bees. And most people don't know that um, there are 1800 species of native bees in California. It, it's really amazing diversity of bees. And um, his website will point you towards plants that are good for bee habitat and what things you can do to, to create more habitat for bees. A couple of events happening in our chapter in Santa Clara Valley, uh, the 50th anniversary celebration will be held 
on Saturday, October 8th. You're all invited. It's free and open to the public. I'm told there will be a planned sale, but it's, um, it's not a walk-in sale. You must order the plants in advance and you can pick them up the day of. Um, our next Growing Natives Garden Tour is next year, April 1st and 2nd. You're all invited. There, there's approximately 50 gardens, mostly home gardens throughout the peninsula and South Bay. And um, it's a good way for you to get a feel for what does an actual garden look like? What does a mature native plant garden look like? Um, so I encourage you to do that. And fin my final slide is a sense of place slide. Um, there's bird's eye gilia in the back. There's baby blue eyes, just a tiny bit there. There's California poppy. And there's a Shasta buckwheat. They're all from California. And this garden is located in San Jose, California. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, Arvind, so much. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think everyone knows that we're record, we have recorded it and are recording it, and that we'll be putting it up somewhere on a YouTube channel to make it available. Um, there were a few questions in the chat, which I'll start with those questions and then um, We'll open it up. So this this one, I know this is a very, this is near and dear to Arvin's heart. This question, um, this is from Daffodil Manning Bowles. How important is it for me as a home gardener to grow plants that are endemic to my area? For example, I live on the coast in San Mateo County, and would love to grow Salvia ipiana, but I see in Cowscape that it's endemic to coastal Southern California. <laughs> Very, very good question. It means that you, you are thinking deeply about this issue. Um, yes, uh, white sage is not native to Northern California. Um, despite that, I have a really thriving, uh, vigorous white sage in my backyard. So um, I think if, if you're growing things in your yard, um, as long as there's habitat value, as long as you're reducing your water use, um, you're not using chemicals, it's all good for the environment. Uh, the concern about planting things out of their native range is if you live next to a, a wildland urban interface, WUI, right? So if your backyard, it, you know, borders on say a county park, you don't want to plant something in your garden that could escape and invade the county park, even if it is native. If it is, if it is not locally native, you don't want it to escape your yard. So for me, I'm living in urban San Jose and I have no such concerns, but I have friends who have large yards bordering the wild, uh, you know, open spaces, and they have to think about this a lot more than I do. So I encourage you to continue asking these questions. And it, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a purity test. You know, we garden for the joy of gardening. And if this brings you joy and supports bees and birds, by all means, do it. Um, watch out for invasive species. There are some native plants which have proved to be invasive outside their range. So just be careful about that. That's all. Um, okay, thank you very much, Arvin. I didn't see any other questions in the chat. If you had one, I'm just gonna ask you to uh, give it now, but let's open it up and I guess just jump in with your questions and comments. Do you have some questions? Okay, well, you keep thinking about your questions, but uh, in the meantime, I want to ask uh, Mike to, Mike, could you kind of um, repeat how people can get onto our mailing list or find out more about us? Because we're sort of limited in our um, publicity right now. We do have a Facebook page and we have a newsletter, but where our website is being recreated right now, we don't have a YouTube channel, but we're working on that. So Mike, you want to give people an idea of how they can, uh, kind of uh, connect with us? 
Well, I want to remind everybody, of course, that uh, that we're on Facebook. Um, just look up California Native Plant Society North San Joaquin chapter. Um, and uh, obviously, while we're while we're here, you could just go ahead and say, hey, I'm interested. I know that there are some people, if you look back, there are actually some people that are from like Southern California and um, from other places, and they probably um, aren't going to become a, an actual member. I mentioned, that, but because I mean, you can, well, you can join the statewide organization and then they give you an opportunity to join two different chapters and which is great um, because you can join the two that really matter. I believe you can pay a little bit more money and actually become members of other chapters too. Um, but um, but basically we have been doing all these tabling events and having people sign up. And I wanna keep those people at least, you know, apprised of our events so that they can come. Uh, our, our purpose, our mission is to spread the word and so we want to make sure everybody knows about uh, native plants. And so um, we don't have a problem with just letting everybody know about our, our different events that are happening. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be having uh, field trips to uh, places that plant native plants or to parks that already have uh, local, you know, genotype native plants and, and things like that. Um, we'll be having a, a volunteer projects to go and work uh, to install native gardens or um, we're going to be promoting uh, um, advocacy for um, uh, you know at, at, like I've already been in front of the Manteca City Council um, pushing for the idea of using native plants in their landscaping and, and it's actually it's, it's I've, I've had some success um, not as much as I want but uh, you know, all that stuff. So um, you can just let us know if you want to be in uh, in there. The I should uh, our my, okay, my, my, my can you can you give them um, an email or they can. Um, yeah. Contact yeah. Let me us. let me get and that. Uh, there to is another sure question. Right um, this was sent directly to me, but I want to read this other question, Arvin. Um, so um, K.F. Pang wrote this last thing Arvin said, why do some native plants become invasive outside its natural range. Can you provide some examples of such native plants and locations where they became invasive as non-desirable native plants? I can I can think of two. Um, there's a variety of buckwheat called um, Iriogonum fasciculatum that natively grows near San Diego. And it was used by Caltrans in many, many um, uh, places where uh, they did some bulldozing and grading, and then they planted Iriogonum fasciculate in the San Diego variety there. And this was done indiscriminately throughout the state. If you travel to Northern California, which is much more moister, wetter than, than San Diego, turns out that it has become invasive there. So the folks in Northern California chapters of CNPS are not very happy at having to ha having their locally native plants having to compete with the San Diego variety. So that's one plant. I believe that um, the coast um, bush lupin, the yellow bush lupin, has also been planted out of context and has become invasive in Northern California. So those are just two examples, but but there are others. So um, that's something to to watch out for if you can monitor your own garden space and make sure nothing gets out you can grow anything you like uh, the problem happens when you are next to a wild area natural area and you're not paying attention and these uh, native plants which are native to another part of state escape and then start out competing with the local local plants so that that's okay, the um, issue. Thank you. So we just have a few more minutes. We're going to end right at eight thirty. Um, I think that would be a good time to stop. Uh, but we are post. I am posting all of our events on the state website, um, 
and that, that was just done. I'm not sure uh, exactly how you find it, but on the state so, website, it, if you can, do you can want I to mention can that? I make can I make two plugs? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I won't take too much time. First plug is for the La Loma Native Garden. So if anyone attending today has not seen it, it doesn't matter if you live in Modesto or not, but if you're in the vicinity, you must make time to go and check it out. It's just amazing. It's, it's, it's immense, it's huge. It's right by a, a major street. It's next to a residential neighborhood. And it's the most beautiful thing about the neighborhood. Um, I've done some garden maintenance. I know what it involves. And it is really uh, very, very well done. I think folks in Modesto should be very proud. But people attending this talk should check that out. And number two, I want to congratulate you for the latest newsletter. So I went through it. It's really nicely put together. And um, if you're in this meeting, please make sure that you get a copy of that PDF so that you can read it for yourself. Oh, uh, I okay. That's put, our, yeah, that was our first newsletter, and um, our, the newsletter committee, which is uh, Mike, Rhonda, and me, put that together. But they did most of the work. Yeah, we're really happy with it. Um, I put my email in the uh, chat, so anybody yeah, who needs uh, to write to me, and and you can write to me uh, at that email, and I can pass it on wherever it needs to go. So if it needs to go to our president or or wherever. Um, you know, uh, at that September 17th event, we are going to be uh, really trying to, um, you know, take signups for, for different events and, and committees and things like that. It'll be a great time to sign up and we'll really just explode after that, I think. Uh, so um, it's going to be it's going to be wonderful. So I hope everybody can make it to that September 17th event. It's wine and cheese social. Um, now I, uh, they're asking you to bring, you know, the wine and cheese and stuff like that to share. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to figure out how to do that safely. But, um, but I think that uh, it's uh, it's going to be wonderful, and I hope everybody can show up. Yeah, the, the new in the newsletter, Mike has a, a section on that, and you know, it's open to everybody. And, and as Arvin said, I mean, it is really. A, a fantastic garden. I did not know it existed when I moved to Modesto, and it's been kind of the highlight, in my opinion, of the entire Modesto area. And this is all due to Rhonda Allen. She uh, conceived, created, uh, worked with the city. It's just it designed everything, and she's still doing a lot of the maintenance. And what we're hoping is that we can all um, jump in and really help her with that. It's two acres. It's a very big garden. Um, Oh, thanks to the, Lisa saying she found, we just, I just had them added today, you know, we're just getting started. So, um, yeah, we'll keep posting there. Um, does anyone else have any questions or you just want to say something to the group about your experience? I think we should invite Rhonda to come on and uh, give us the address to the La Loma Native Garden. And uh, since... Hi. Yes, it's 1805 Encina Avenue. Um, so it's right on Encina Avenue near La Loma Junior High School. It's um, kind of east of downtown if you're new to Modesto. But anyway, we're going to have a nice event that day. I hope everybody can come enjoy a walk in, in the garden. So thank you, Arvin. You are very inspirational. We need you to talk to all of our city councils. <laughs> Thank you. <I'm> getting natives. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great? Just my neighborhood would be great. Yeah. I really want to I go to city it. council. I, I moved here yeah. to the Bay Area, and here in Modesto, I mean, all the all the houses around me, they've got lawns and and you know shrubs, all, all non native. I mean, I was just done. This is the last place to have a lawn. Well, um, we're lucky to okay. have Carl. Because he's growing our natives for us now, that really helps having a place to get some. Right. So. so I just remind everyone that our next talk is uh, Monday, September 12th at 7 p.m. And this topic is really going to be informative for a lot of people because it's reliable California native plants for a garden with no irrigation. Um, this is 
uh, Cape Cage Garden in San Jose. Um, it's an acre and no irrigation. It's it's an incredible garden. He'll be telling us, you know, how he's been so successful. Hey, Cynthia. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to. Can we ask Judy to come back on? And she put down an events list and just explain what that is, and some of the stuff she she put there on the chat. Oh, I was just throwing some things in there. There's um the event, link to the state events page, the link to this the link to the state plant sale page, which plant sales will be coming up in the fall across the state, and then uh, your chapter Facebook page. But um, KF is also asking me an email about um about events across the state from different chapters. And, you know, uh, I would recommend, I think KF is on Facebook, but <clears throat> liking all the different chapters and, um, you know, liking their Facebook page because then you'll get notifications when they post events. Um, there's a lot of talks across the state though. Hey, you know, give, me, give, give a pitch for the uh, CMPS Facebook group. Sure. <laughs> this is the MBS Facebook group. It's very large. So it's nearly uh, 60,000 members. Yeah, we um, can't believe it. And Judy's so. one of the admins. So, and so is uh, Arvind, actually. So is Arvind. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, listen, everyone. I, I was, and thank you, Judy. Judy said in on our first presentation here as kind of our mentor, make sure everything uh, went well. And I think it went great. Um, thank you, Arvind, for an incredible talk. This, uh, the first I learned about the things he's talking here was when he gave this talk quite a few years ago in, in Santa Clara and I was just blown away by it. So I thought it would be good to share. Um, thank you everyone for coming. If you have any comments, just email me or, uh, or Mike. Good job guys. Good job. Thank you, Arvin. Bye Rhonda. Thank you Bye. for your garden. Bye everyone. Bye. You can stop the recording. <laughs> Trying to find out where I do that. Yeah, just down the red button. The end button? No, that'll end the whole meeting, right? Uh, no, the red button, see where it says recording? Or you can, on the bottom of the screen, it says record. I think Should we're down to seven of us, so the, the meeting is essentially ended. <laughs>